Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Namal De Silva, and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for American Bird Conservancy. Thanks for joining us for this sixth and final episode of our Birdability Birders series, co-hosted by ABC and Birdability to support birders with disabilities and other health concerns. It's been such a pleasure hearing from some of our attendees over these past six months about how the webinars have helped them feel seen, have acknowledged their struggles, provided tips and creative ways to continue or to begin birding. Um, attendees have grieved and celebrated alongside our speakers, and some have said that they've gained tools and perspectives that help them become more inclusive within their own parks and groups. Um, for me personally, these webinars have placed a spotlight on the healing power of birds and nature. They've helped me think about grief and obstacles and resilience. I've revisited the idea of the difference between ability and capability, reminded myself to slow down and to be present whenever I can, to listen more carefully to the birds that are around me, and to seek solace and renewal in wild places. Um, a huge thank you to Freya McGregor and Virginia Rose from Birdability, um, to Erica Sanchez Vasquez and the ABC communications team, and to our sign language interpreters for making this series a reality. Um, before we begin our discussions, just a few logistics. Um, automated captions are available for this webinar. You can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and clicking show subtitles. You can drag the captions wherever you like on the screen. We are honored to have Christina Riley and Paula Meyer pro providing American Sign Language interpretation today. Please submit the qu your questions using the Q&A box. You'll also be able to upvote any questions that you would like to have answered. We'll answer as many of those as we can um, during the Q&A portion. We have a long time for these webinars. Um, we have a full 90 minutes. Um, a little bit about our two organizations. American Bird Conservancy works with many partners throughout the Americas to halt extinctions, to safeguard habitats, and to build capacity for bird conservation. We want more people to enjoy and care for birds and the environment, including people who have been historically ignored within the conservation field. Birdability uses education, outreach, and advocacy to make the birding community and the outdoors more welcoming, inclusive, safe, and accessible for everybody. We hope that these webinars will illuminate the perspectives, needs, and aspirations of birders um, with a range of disabilities and health concerns, including those who are ne neurodivergent. So to introduce our guest, um, our guest today is Paul Miller, who uses the pronouns he, him. Paul has had FSHD since birth and now uses a power wheelchair to get around. FSHD, or fasciocapulohumeral dystrophy, is a slowly progressive condition which results in the weakening of muscles in the face, shoulders, and arms. When Paul started birding, his difficulty using his arms and hands meant that special adaptive birding equipment was necessary to support move and focus his binoculars and scope. This equipment didn't exist, so he built some himself. He is a birdability captain and the chair of the Accessibility Committee at Sacramento Audubon, and is passionate about sharing his inventions to help others overcome obstacles. Our co-host, Freya McGregor, is the birdability coordinator and will serve as the interviewer for all six of these webinars. Freya is an occupational therapist and her experience with modifying physical and cultural environments with mm -hmm. adapting tasks and equipment to enable participation and developing public health programs helps guide Birdability's overall approach. Her background is in blindness and low vision services. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Freya. Thanks everyone. So glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, Namal. Hi, everyone. My name is Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her. Um, Namal, Erica, and everyone at ABC, this has been such a wonderful opportunity to um, help provide representation and uh, education and advocacy and learning opportunities for, for us. And, and for, I know a lot of our guests have, have echoed those. So thank you again for um, sharing your mic with us. Um, in this in this series and in this program. 
Um, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Muscogee Creek people, now known as Alabama. Um, many Muscogee people were forcibly removed by the US government, but there are still Muscogee people here today, and I would like to pay my respects to the Muscogee people for the stewardship of the land on which I live, work, and go birding on. Uh, if you have missed any of these previous um, episodes in this Birdability Birder series, they are all up on the uh, Birdability YouTube channel. So I'm going to stick a link in the chat right now. Uh, so you can go and watch any of these back if you'd like. <laughs> it's also, as it happens, International Wheelchair Day. So um, Paul uses a power wheelchair. We're going to be celebrating this day pretty well. But there's also another um, episode you might be interested in. The first one with Virginia Rose, she uses a manual wheelchair. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, I guess, a little bit about the difference between manual and power wheelchairs um, today, but check that out if you would like. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that um, today we're not trying to make any claims that um, this series has represented every single kind of bird or with every single kind of access challenge. Um, disability is incredibly diverse and even within one diagnosis people are different people and have different access needs and um, Paul will be sharing about his experiences and we're not claiming that this is representative of everyone who uses a power wheelchair or everyone who has SFHD muscular dystrophy. Um, although if you, I saw in the chat that a couple of people um, also have um, FSHD or another kind of muscular dystrophy. So yeah, if, if you would like to share your answers and your experiences mm -hmm. um, as we go through this conversation, um, I won't be able to look at the chat as we talk. I, I can't do two things at once, but other people will and don't feel obliged. But if you would like, um, Paul and I will be looking at the chat after the event um, and other people here today will be looking at the chat. So please feel free um, if you'd like to um, share some of your experiences and tips and tricks you've learned along the way and things like that as well. Um, and finally, um, because safety is really important and it's part of making places, including online places like Zoom webinars, um, accessible and inclusive, um, just a note that um, we really appreciate you um, being respectful uh, in, in the chat uh, and as a way to make sure that, that our guests and, and everyone else in attendance uh, feel safe to be here. So finally, uh, if you're new to birdability, Nam will introduce us really well. We're, we're one year old as a nonprofit, and I need to mention this now, or I'm going to forget. Uh, our t shirts are currently on sale <laughs> until tomorrow. So I'm going to put the link in the chat if you're watching this recorded. Sorry. Um, all the proceeds from these t shirts, there's a, a big white breasted nut hatch on the back. It says birding is for everybody and it has our website. Um, all the proceeds from the sales of these t-shirts go to supporting our work. Uh, so uh, I will put the link in the chat. If you would like to get hold of a t-shirt, there's long sleeve t-shirts and short sleeve t-shirts and hoodies as well. So there's that little plug. All right. Um, and you can also follow Vertibility on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube at Vertibility. Um, and our website is vertibility.org if you'd like to learn more. Um, about what we're doing and and find some more resources that we have up there about access and inclusion and disability and birding. Okay, Paul, hi, <laughs> how's it going? Um, thanks for joining us. Would you like to Absolutely. introduce yourself? I'm Paul Miller. Um, <clears throat> so birding is not my primary story. So I was a professional transportation planner for 25 years in the corporate world as a consultant. Um, I retired five years ago. And um, when I first retired, um, you know, when you retire, obviously it's like, okay, I'm going to go do some fun things. So I got invited um, to a birding seminar. And it was an eight lecture, eight uh, field trip uh, series. And so that's how I got into birding. Um, so um, a little bit about my FSHD. Um, I, my sister, who was eight years older than me, also had FSHD. And so that became my first awareness of what muscular dystrophy was. So I was eight and she was 16 when she was diagnosed. And she ended up being a nurse. And um, so she was very 
knowledgeable about the disease. And um, as far as I knew, she was going to be the only person in the family with muscular dystrophy. Um, but, you know, track forward, she knew early on that I probably had it, but she didn't say anything. Um, the way that I found out that I had muscular dystrophy, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people you will uh, remember the standardized tests that we had to do in high school. You had to run a mile, you had to jump, you had to do certain things. And I was, I knew I was not good athletic, athletically, but I, you know, I just didn't know I had muscular dystrophy. So one of the things I couldn't do was a layup. And now I know why I couldn't do a layup in basketball. But anyway, so one of the uh, tests was the uh, parallel bar. And I jumped up and I couldn't get off. And so at 16, I found out that I had muscular dystrophy. Um, so muscular dystrophy is a slowly progressive neuromuscular disease. So up until about 10 years ago, I really was pretty fully capable. I skied, surfed, you know, I could, I could do a lot of things and I did them and I'm really glad I did. Um, but so the disease goes through various plateaus and uh, areas of decline. So you can be fine for quite a while and then all of a sudden you start going into a period of atrophy and then that can plateau off. And, and so it's a stair step, um, slowly progressive condition. So where I am now is I use a walker 100% of the time. Um, I have what are called AFOs, they're braces on my ankles. And if I don't have the, um, the braces and I don't have my walker, um, you better be waiting for me to fall on my face because that's kind of where I am. Uh, the walker is wonderful. Um, I use the power chair primarily for longer distances and birding um, is one of those. So Great, thank money. you. Uh -huh. and, and there's lots of different kinds of muscular dystrophy, right? But there's, mm -hmm. they, all, they all involve muscles getting weaker and weaker, no matter if you were trying to like go to the gym and lift lots of weights, like slowly, slowly your muscles are getting weaker and weaker. And so you, after a while you can't do certain things. Um, and could you, could you just explain the fascio-scapulo-humeral bit um, and, and how that, like what that means for you and, and where you're at right now? So the whole uh, muscular dystrophy um, genetic condition is a spectrum. And so the, they've labeled uh, the type that you have based upon like with mine, it's primarily the muscle groups, the initial muscle groups that are affected. Mm -hmm. So uh, the face, the, the scapular and the stomach area are the ones that from an early age start to atrophy. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've learned is that there's a large population of people that have this genetic defect but it doesn't present itself in an extreme way. So somebody might just think they have sloped shoulders and have no idea that they actually have a genetic condition that causes certain muscles to atrophy. Um, in my case, which is so, and so everyone that has FSHD, um, it, I'm on a Facebook page. So I, we always are talking about, you know, we like to make fun of our condition. And one of the things that everybody says is we're all on a different Mr. Toad's wild ride because none of us experience the same muscle groups atrophying. None of us experience um, what another person might experience. The, my experience was that those initial muscles were the ones that atrophied and they can stay that way or it can spread to the rest of the body. It isn't only limited to, to the muscle groups within the definition of the disease, it's just it presents itself initially by those muscles being the weakest. Sure, and when we were talking um, a few days ago, so this, folks who don't know, the scapula is like your shoulder blade um, and there's lots of muscles 
um, on your upper back and your shoulder area that are responsible for moving your arms um, right. and your shoulders around. So um, you, you said that um, you had some, you have difficulty moving your arms up, for example, right. holding binoculars, right? Like that's, that's really right. difficult to get up into that position. Right. So even from an early age, um, so like right now, I can only uh, lift my arm a little less than parallel, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always could lift it about there. Um, so it, the reason I'm stumbling a little bit, so you can propel your arm up by certain muscles throwing it up, mm -hmm. but it's the ability for it to stay in a certain position for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, even though I can still get my hand up to my mouth and, you know, about that high, it's other muscle groups will be affected if I try to put mm -hmm. my arm in a place that it doesn't, it isn't uh, supported by muscles. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a pair of binoculars, if I had to, I could probably lift them up for maybe a second or two, but that's completely different than birding for hours and moving them around. So um, there's this, and I'm, I'm going into this a little bit in, in detail because um, and Namal said something that I think registered with me and the difference between ability and capability. Mm -hmm. And I heard that and it really registered with me. So there are certain things I'm capable of doing. I can <clears throat> still, I'm ambulatory, um, but I wouldn't consider my, I have the ability to bird without my power chair. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is, as you, as you said, I have certain muscle groups that have, that have atrophied and I have certain uh, range of motion limitations. Mm -hmm. But the activity of birding is one that I have, that's a repetitive muscle firing. So unless those muscles are completely healthy, if I go out and try to focus binoculars or lift binoculars or push my wheelchair or yeah, my, um, my walker for a period of time, <clears throat> then what happens is I literally have to have a therapy day the next day. I'm, I'm in, I, my muscles have really been overworked. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit more in, you know, in detail of, because I think there's the two parts. Mm -hmm. um, there's the fact that certain muscles are atrophied and um, I can go through the, uh, my daily routine and I don't think about it if it's just a quick movement. But if I have to really focus and do something for a long period of time, like, like mousing you know, in, on a computer, I have to be careful you know, I have to have my, my um, elbow supported when I'm mousing a lot. Otherwise, you know, I'll, my shoulders will get sore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Thank, yeah, thank you for, yeah, one thing to do at once, but another thing to do it repetitively, mm -hmm. like repeatedly mm -hmm. and birding. You tend to, if yeah. you're using the right. instruments, you tend to use them more than once. Exactly. On <clears throat> yeah. um, and for more than just one second. Um, exactly, yep. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. So, um. We skipped a little bit ahead there, but I did just want to ask you about some of the joys you get from birding. Uh, there, there are so many amazing things that so many different people find in, in birds and birding. And um, it's really cool to hear different people's, um, the things that bring them back. Like, what is it about birding that that gets you out and gets you excited and makes you want to keep keep being part of the birding community? Well, it's there's a lot of facets to that question. So one of them would be, it's something that I'm capable of doing to be out in nature, mm -hmm. okay? Like for example, my wife is an avid backpacker and that's the last thing I'd be capable of doing. Mm -hmm. But if I was capable of doing, I might not be into birding. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, for me, I think being in our natural world is a necessity. It's not just a bonus, 
And I think especially with living in the built environment, it is critical for me, and I think for everybody, but for me to be out in that natural world. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I didn't have muscular dystrophy, um, I might be interviewed about uh, what mountain I'm going to climb next month. But because I don't have that ability, what I found was, and not knowing, I literally stumbled into this. And that was, I could get almost that same level of cellular joy by watching a bird. Mm -hmm. And the more I did it, the more I realized that I didn't need to move my body out into a pristine area. Mm -hmm. I could literally sit in my backyard because the other aspect of this is the reality is birds are all around us, right? It's like, oh yeah, they're birds, just like my dog. Well, but my dog isn't wild. My dog relies on me. My dog is domesticated. And it was when I realized that if I'm yearning for the wild, if I'm yearning for mother nature, if I'm yearning for whatever that's very difficult to put into words that nature gives to us, I've got wild creatures in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I don't take care of them. I, and so then when I realized that I have a piece of nature that is flying into my backyard, and then the more I learned about birds and the fact they migrate and how they migrate and these little teeny birds migrate thousands of miles and, not, and it wasn't just maybe the 15 birds that are, you know, resident that I could see. Oh, wait a minute. I have certain birds coming through. They're going from North America to South America. And guess what? They're going to land in my backyard for maybe a day. And I'm getting chills right now. <laughs> there's something about being able to put your finger on that pulse. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a bird that maybe two weeks ago was up in Alaska. And this week it's literally landing in your tree. And next week it's going to be in South America. It's magic. And so for yeah. me, being that I, I, it's, it, you know, it takes a lot for me to get my body around, but if I'm sitting in my patio, it doesn't take anything for me to be transported. Um, in, in, and it doesn't matter what I'm looking at. I can look at a, at a, a bird that stays resident, but it's like, Oh, and then you go into the deeper part. And that is some of these birds, only live for a very short period of time, okay? And let's say, I I, I should know more. I'm, I'm not an ornithologist. Couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years. Let's use you a couple of years. Um, but when you think about that, so their behavior, the way they act, the way they are looking around the backyard, the way that they look for food is inherent in their genes. So we're seeing this little snapshot. And this, this, this hit me a while back. It's like, wait a minute. This isn't like a bird that's been around forever and it took all this time to learn something. It learns it almost instantly after it's fledged. And so I'm like, okay, well, am I seeing a bird that's two years old, a year old, six months old? And if I actually saw a bird that was 100 years old, would it look any different? So then I went, oh, shoot, I'm actually seeing back in time by seeing that re-genetic um, uh, birth of a species. You can realize that if you went back 10,000 years, it would look the same. Like my honorary scrub jays in my backyard 10,000 years in the future or in the, in the past were probably still very honorary birds. They were the pirates of the bird world. And then I thought, okay, what was, what was in my backyard 10,000 years ago? And I'm imagining my an oak forest because that's kind of the natural um, um, terrain. And I'm imagining a, 
um, Native American that was here. And also talking about the honorary, I'm sure they didn't call it a scrub jay, but the spirit, that they called it some spirit. So to me, the birds teleport me to many, many different dimensions. That's so. awesome. Thank you, Paul. That's, um, I think you could probably convert a few folks to birding just with that, just with that um, <laughs> sermon. I don't know. Maybe that's the that wrong word. But... Freya, my wife calls it. And so if, if you know um, the um, scientist Carl Sagan, and he had mm -hmm. this series uh, Cosmos, and his big thing was billions and billions. So if my wife hears me going on, at that level of detail, she goes, oh, God, there he goes. This is billions and billions again. But it's just who I am. And evidently very much in love with birds, uh, which yes. is wonderful. Hey, totally switching um, from birds to your wheelchair. <laughs> um, speaking of International Wheelchair Day and power wheelchairs, and um, I was wondering if you could give us just a really quick little tour of your wheelchair and what, what components of your wheelchair um, are particularly important for you? Everyone's wheelchairs are different because they everyone has different needs. And and what what bits of your wheelchair um, are re really important? Where is my okay? So how I'm? Can you see much of the chair at all right now? Not really, because because you're taking up a fair bit of it. So maybe you could even just describe. You could yeah, describe it loud. Let me do that. Let me describe. <clears throat> I was hoping we could zoom back out and, and look at my chair. Um, for, so for those that saw the um, photo um, with the announcement, that gives a good example because it's got a nice side view of my chair. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm in a little bit different situation than most. Currently, where my body is at, I do not need a, a power chair 100% of the time because I'm still ambulatory. And it's important for me <clears throat> with my condition to continue to be ambulatory as far as, as long as I can. But so for me, the power wheelchair became something I wanted to bird. So it's, it's, a story that starts with me building a power chair and realizing it wasn't very capable. And so then I started to think about, okay, well, do I need a power, do I need to buy a power chair that will accommodate me in the future so that it would be ability for the, <clears throat> it would have the ability to work within a small indoor space. And that's typically the, the, the focus that somebody would have in picking a power chair is that it works within their full daily environment. Um, and they would have to have a vehicle to get it in and get it back out. So I have the luxury that right now I don't need to have a power chair that you know gets me around the house. So, <clears throat> My focus was a, a, a power chair that had the capability to get me over rough terrain, because as we know, most birding places are not paved. And so I considered a chair that was fairly capable, because I thought, well, okay, if I get a chair that's fairly capable, it get me to 50% of the areas that I want to go. But one of the things that I'm doing, um, I am currently on the board of the Sacramento Audubon, and I am conducting accessible um, field trips. And as part of that, uh, both my wife and I decided, you know, you should probably get a chair that's more capable so that if you ever got into a situation where there was something you had to get up, go over, you could. So of course, you know, being a guy, you know, I'm gonna wanna get a four wheel drive wheelchair, right? And I did. So if you look at the photo, it, this, this wheelchair came from Australia. 
Um, and it's literally built as an all-terrain chair. Mm -hmm. um, it'll go in sand, it will go in snow. It has knobby tires that each, each tire has a motor. So it is far more capable than most um, power chairs. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like, because I have the luxury um, and I'm using it primarily for birding and for leading trips, I wanted something that I could really rely on if I came across something that, you know, because, and this, this is uh, what happened with the chair, the power chair that I built. Um, I thought, oh, I, it's a fairly powerful chair I can get around. The reality is, <clears throat> and I'm sure all those that are watching that are actually in either power or manual wheelchairs know a very small impediment can stop you. You know, you can have a, a crack in the sidewalk. You know, certain chairs weren't able to go over that or, or a rocky surface. And so that's what happened. I, I would go to places that were paved and I thought, you know, this chair can go almost anywhere. And then I got invited out to a, a, a birding area that had a compact, compacted dirt trails. And I went 150 feet from the car and I couldn't go any further. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the features of my chair um, that I really, really like, um, one, I don't have to think about the terrain that I'm going. I, I literally can fully focus on the birds. And, you know, I've, I've even taken it up a, a sand dune at 45 degrees to figure out its capabilities. And so it allows me to really be at ease mm -hmm. that I know that this chair can go anywhere. And this is something that's, that is going to register with a lot of people walk, watching. The limitations of a mobility device are going to dictate where you bird. Mm -hmm. And that's very frustrating because if there's an area that holds a lot of birds but doesn't have any accessible areas, or if you think it's accessible because it looks accessible and you start driving down it and realize, oops, that was a mistake. Um, so I know that um, so many people are gonna really register. So part of this is the reason I bought the power chair, this one for this period of my life is to fully enjoy what I call immersive birding. And that is being able to really fully focus on the birds. And once I'm in this chair and it's got a joystick, so I don't have to, there's no steering wheel or no, you know, so it's as easy as a movement of my thumb. And I, it has a 12 mile range. So I can go out all day. I can burn all day and I, it, I'm not fatigued at all. Sure. Um, for folks who aren't sure, by the way, between the difference between a manual wheelchair and a power wheelchair, a manual wheelchair is um, one that you either, it's self-propelled, the person sitting in it wheels themselves or someone behind pushes, uh, and a power wheelchair is one that has a battery um, and usually driven with some kind of joystick, although there's amazing um, chin um, steering devices and like sip and puff things if people haven't got the use of their their hands or arms um manual wheelchairs are a lot lighter weight you some people who are otherwise like fit and healthy and don't have any injuries can do things like um wheelies to get up a step maybe and maybe they can fold their chair and put it in their car um power wheelchairs are really heavy <laughs> they can't do wheelies um you, you can't pick up a power wheelchair like someone can't just lift that up so there's the, all these different things between the two anyhow um that's slightly off topic although not really if you'd like to learn a little bit more about wheelchairs and um wheelchair a little bit of basic wheelchair etiquette and stuff there's a link in the um chat it's from the vertibility blog from this day last year um we, i wrote up a post about in, in honor of international wheelchair day last year so um all the stuff is still true <laughs> 
from a year ago. So check that out if, you, if you'd like a little bit more about wheelchairs. Um, another thing, Paul, I wanted to mention really quickly before we go off of your wheelchair, um, we were talking because of your muscular dystrophy impacting your, your shoulder and neck and face muscles, that that headrest is really important for you. Is that right? It's, it's, it's critical. <clears throat> and um, especially, you know, so one of the, the <clears throat> I, I didn't mention this feature, but one of the features of this chair, um, and I can show it real quick because I think this is important. So I'm going to zoom out and, and just show one of the features that I forgot about, but I think is, is super critical. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be some out there that are envious. So I'm gonna do two things. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show, so right now I bird, so I was able to attach and make um, this support. So this support holds my scope um, and my camera. And it's got, it's got a, uh, what's called a pan tilt head. So it moves upwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. We can go over this later, but one of the a, one of the aspects of the of the chair. So when you're birding, right? If you need to look up, then you have to angle up. Well, look where the eyepiece is. It's down by my chest. So one of the features that I that I added to this chair, or that came with this chair, was my water bottle, um, is the tilt capabilities. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> with the headrest, when I'm tilted, so I can be out. And if I've got birds up in a tree, um, I literally would have a really difficult time keeping my head so I can rest and then I can look. Mm -hmm. So the tilt aspect um, is really important um, as we talk about um, having uh, scopes or binoculars attached to the chair. Yeah, so let's let's go straight into that. So um, you told me once you described yourself as a tinkerer, um, which <laughs> might explain most people, by the way, do not build their own power wheelchairs. That's quite an intense <laughs> endeavor. So <laughs> that's not standard practice, but there you go. Paul, Paul is a tinkerer. Um, and so, yeah, tell us tell us a little bit about your your mount for your scope in your camera and what that allows you to do and, and how you kind of created it. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back a little bit. And so one of the things as we talk about um, adaptive birding equipment, um, so I have a website and it's on the birdability, if you can post that. So it's got all the photos, it's got, so everything I'm going to talk about, if you're interested in it, um, there's more detail on my, on my uh, website. It's coming so, into the chat right now. Okay. So, <clears throat> and I'm going to, I'm going to stop you because I dropped my water bottle. I got to pick it up. Otherwise While you pick it up, I'll just, I'll talk for a little bit. Okay. Um, so adaptive birding equipment, there's lots of different kinds. It's really, really cool. And a lot of birders don't know about it because we just don't see it in, in our everyday birding experiences. But we have a page on our website of um, different kinds of adaptive birding equipment. Um, Paul's website goes into a lot more detail about the stuff that he uses, and he's going to talk more about that tonight. But um, there's the page about adaptive birding equipment on our website. It, it's there's equipment for people with all kinds of different access challenges. So um, not all of it is is relevant to Paul or or, or right. any particular birder, but um, some of it might be. So sorry, you ready to go again, Paul? <laughs> so um, so the. The journey that I, I took in uh, coming up with the various pieces of adaptive equipment was primarily based upon my range of motion limitations. So um, the first one was literally holding binoculars up to my eyes. And so Freya, show, show what you've got. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know this. There's this really little nifty thing called a binocular mount. And almost every pair of binoculars has the ability <clears throat> to be mounted on a tripod or a monopod, but most people don't realize that. So this is what it looks like. Here's a pair of binoculars. Here's a monopod. 
Um, and this, this little thing here, that's the twister that tightens and loosens it, screws on to the same um, screw, like thread screw, um, that, that a monopod or a tripod has. So this is a really interesting option for people, a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, but there's the binocular mount and the binoculars by itself. You can get these from various places. There's links on that, on that webpage that I just put in the chat. Um, the, the binoculars, almost, almost every pair of binoculars has this. There's a thread in the middle between the two um, barrels. Now, so this pair of binoculars. Freya, Freya, real quick. Yes. Oh, maybe you're going to show. So there's a little cap. Right. So a lot of people don't know it's there because there's a little cap that covers it. Right. So that, yeah. that, that, these are collar binoculars that, that says collar on them and you wouldn't know what's underneath or even that there is anything underneath uh, right. unless you try to untwist it. Um, and then you find the thread that screws in to the binocular mount. So yeah, what does you, what, what's mounted on your chair, Paul? So, well, so that's where I started. And so I think it's important um, because the, there's a full range of needs. Um, and I kind of went through each one of those um, over the past five years. Um, so I started with exactly what you showed, which was attaching my binoculars to a monopod. Now, the monopod is not just a uh, fixed length. And maybe you can show that, uh, Freya, where you can expand it. Yeah, like, like a tripod, um, a yeah. monopod is just one leg, mono. Right. Um, right. And yeah, you can, this, this is mine and it's folded up, but you can extend it like, a, like how you would with a tripod. Right. <clears throat> so that would give, that gave me the ability um, to raise the binoculars, um, by extending the monopod up to my eyes. But then you get into <clears throat> the details. And again, the devil's in the details. So it's fine uh, to look straight, but if you need to look up, you are going to need to actually push the staff out to raise the angle, which means you have to use your arms. And so it became impossible for me. So what I did, and I'll, and I'll back up and show this, this is oversized, so you wouldn't use this on a monopod, but it's the same. Well, I showed it earlier. It's that pan tilt head. So you can get a small pan tilt head that goes between the monopod and the binoculars. And with that, you can change the angle. Okay. So then, um, you can raise it up, and if, you're, if your head is tilted back to look 45 degree up into a tree, you can raise it up a little bit further and angle it, right? Mm -hmm. And so then the binoculars is pointing where it needs to point. Well, that was fine and dandy, um, and I could, and this is what I was saying earlier, even though I literally can't slowly put my arm above my head, if I throw it, you see, it went up there, and then I would throw it up on top of the binoculars. It's like, oh, cool. I can now focus it because if you can't focus it, what are you going to do? Well, that lasted for a couple of weeks until I was like, oh, I'm going to need therapy if I try that full time. So then that brought me into um, creating, and this is again on my website, um, an electric focus, which has a cord. There we go. And so that top part is the electric focus and it has a cord and it would, you can uh, adjust the focus of the binoculars or the scope down there. And that means your hands can be literally, you know, in front of you. And that worked really well. Um, and it would, would work really well for anybody that is still ambulatory. It works really well with a walker because what you can do is instead of standing, you can, so I've, the walker that I have has a seat on it. There's a wheeled walker with uh, brakes and a seat. So I could sit and then I could 
uh, adjust the height and I could bird by sitting. Um, and my hands would never have to be anywhere above my knee level because that's where the controls were for the, for the focus. And I really think, well, okay, so now we go back to the, the tinkerer. So the moment I realized that focusing binoculars was just something I couldn't do other than maybe a minute or two, I went to the trusty internet and did one zillion searches and found nothing. There was literally nothing out there for, for uh, an autofocus binocular. So I've always been a tinkerer and I've always, you know, I, I, when I retired, I said, you know, give me a, a little workshop and you're not going to see me. And it was true. I, I did way too much of my workshop. So one of them was building um, and finding. So I found a electric focus um, that's built for a telescope. But obviously you can't, you know, there's no way to mount it to the binoculars. So that round thing that you saw over the binoculars, again, this, none of this was made to be put together. So it was, I think it was a support for a telescope tube, but I thought, well, that, that would work for my, my situation. So over the years, and this is gonna lead somewhere because uh, I've been working on this, and this is a good segue. So my goal with the adaptive birding is to, um, and you'll see it on my website, is to create something that is um, adjustable for almost any situation and that doesn't need um, custom work. Because when I realized that if I wanted to open up what I'm doing to other people, they would have to have the ability to do the custom work. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, the initial uh, adaptive equipment that I did, there was a lot of custom work. I mean, there, I was having to drill and I was having to, you know, tap and do different things and put washers and, you know, it was like, there's no way this, that, that somebody else could, to, could make that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that worked until I needed, um, or and that worked along with the first power uh, wheelchair that I built. So what I did as I built that power wheelchair with a little um, attachment for the monopod right in front of the seat. So it was no different than my walker, um, but it had I could I wouldn't even have to get up to to move it around. I it was obviously a power chair. And so I birded for quite a while with the monopod, the, the exact one we just showed from the power wheelchair that I built. But then, you know, I love to add complexity and that is I wanted to do photography as well. And so um, I, on the first power chair, I actually built two things. I built a little, attachment for my camera. And then I had the monopod, but it just became too clumsy. It was either I'm going to either use my, my binoculars or I'm going to use my camera. So um, fast forward to uh, actually getting the power wheelchair that I have. Um, and so I knew I needed to make some type of um, adapter that was, that was uh, easy to move, that had a lot of range of motion. And, and this is even more important, that was really strong. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I ordered a few and, and um, you'll see these in camera stores where they've got a, a, a little ball connection and, you know, but they're not that strong. And so uh, my camera, my scope, and, and the um, pan tailed head is fairly heavy. So I built a custom support for what you saw earlier was the combination of my camera, my scope, um, and the pan tailed head. So that is something that, I mean, I love it. I mean, it, it is, I've been using it now for, it's about six months to eight months. Um, and 
I don't need the electric focus. And let me let me kind of show you why I currently don't need the electric focus. So I'm going to zoom out again. And so if you can see, let me zoom in a little bit. Well, maybe zoom out. So see where my elbow is? It's on the support of my chair. And so here, it gives me the ability to have my hand that I'm not supporting my shoulders on the focus of my scope. Mm -hmm. And so for now, the way that I'm using this, I don't need the electric focus, but not everybody can get their hand up this high. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm not using the electric. Um, and then I can also manually um, adjust, you know, just like that. So I can move and I can move and adjust it. So not everybody has that capability. Sure. And, and a lot of people, not everyone has the ability to focus, even if they can use their um, arms and shoulders, they might not have the fine um, motor, um, the fine motor ability or the right. um, sensation in their fingertips to right. do the little fiddly tiny little thing that mm -hmm. is involved with, um, with focusing. So yeah, this, this adaptive equipment stuff is, is really, really cool. And actually that's why I, I grabbed this pair of binoculars um, these pair, this pair of Koa binoculars, it has a really big, um, mm. like divot um, I, in the, on the on the focal wheel, um, right. and so you can kind of dig your finger in to to shift it rather than do a little tiny soft thing. And I I know a few different folks um, with different access challenges who might find that they can mm. focus these binoculars, but couldn't focus another pair with with the different um, really thin um lines on on the mm -hmm. wheel it's yeah there's i mean like like everything everybody is different everybody has different needs but it's really cool to get different ideas from different people um because something there might might work for someone who's who's listening hey before we um go to the q a um part of this tonight uh if you're interested in seeing some of paul's photos um, you can follow him on Instagram at fshdbirder. The link is in the chat. Um, some of his gorgeous photos, it's really fun to be virtually birding in California when I don't live in California um, <laughs> through, through Paul's photos. Um, hey, Paul, thank you for that really cool tour of your of your gear and what you've built. And, and yeah, there's a lot more on your website about where those different components came from and how you put them together. So if folks are more interested in interested in learning more about that, go and check out Paul's website uh fshdbirder.org um a lot of this is a we're veering off to a different topic again but a lot of people a lot of well-meaning people um non-disabled folks often want to help people with disabilities and birders are no exception out on the trail or something is is there any help that you wish uh, a non-disabled birder might offer and is there is there a particular kind of help that, that would, like, is there a way that you would like people to help you if they met you out birding? Or would you rather be left alone, which is totally, <laughs> totally legitimate as well? That's a really great question, Freya. So, you know, just the <clears throat> um, incidental person, you know, if I'm out birding by myself, um, I, I actually love engage, engaging with people. Um, and so that really, unless, you know, unless um, they, you know, they don't understand that, you know, their actions are going to scare birds. But, you know, typically I'm not too concerned about um, the incidental person. But, and this is a huge subject um, about birding from a, a power chair or manual chair, Virginia, I know you completely will understand this. Um, the way that I bird is completely different than the way that most people bird. So if I'm inviting friends out, they're coming out with me and I either say, okay, I'm going to bird at your pace or you bird at my pace. But, and this is where I haven't been out with a, a 
a group, a Audubon group, because one, you know, unless it is uh, designed as accessible, um, I can't get to the places that you they can walk. But the way they bird is very different. So the way that I bird, I bird with a scope, which means I'm birding at a longer distance. Um, I'm birding uh, very slowly. Um, I'll move into an area and pick a vantage point and then look for the birds instead of see a bird and go try to find it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really important that all those that are listening or, or that they can tell other birders, it's very important to think about the requirements of a birder that isn't fully ambulatory and, and has some type of special need and really talk to them. I mean, if they've been birding for a while, they'll know exactly how they bird and what works for them. Uh, the pace of the birding is very important. Somebody might not be able to walk really fast. Um, I bird with uh, uh, one of my friends and I change the way that I bird because I know that they bird in a certain way. They like to cover a longer period of ground. So um, I think it's important that people know that everybody that birds um, with either adaptive equipment or with special needs, um, you know, they're going to bird differently. And there should be a, a, a great discussion as to how um, that, mm -hmm. that marries up with the way that you bird. And, and I know when we spoke a few days ago, you were telling me that um, other folks that you might be birding with are like birding all over the place. <laughs> they're rotating, they're twisting, they're turning over there behind them. Right. And, and you bird forwards, right? Right, right. And the, the reason is this, the chair that I have um, cannot turn in, on a dime. It, 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 it is a big tank of a chair. So it, so when I, if I see a bird left or right at 90 degrees, I know I'm not going to be able to adjust and get my scope on it. So if I'm birding with somebody, I'll actually say, oh, hey, over there, you know, and then they can quickly look at it. Um, and then the other thing is if somebody is walking in front of me, that doesn't work well because typically they'll be in my range of view of, of where I'm viewing. But I mean, so just that little detail there of, birding in a certain you know area and in front of me that's very specific and mm -hmm. most birders aren't going to realize that that limitation they're going to you know if there's a wonderful bald eagle 20 feet behind us they're going to wing around mm -hmm. and so and i and and so the other aspect too is is i've had birders that have in a bald eagle specifically, they found the bald eagle ahead of me. They were the scout and they said, oh, okay, Paul, come up here. Okay, and you can turn here and you can look at it this way. And so having somebody know your capabilities or, or, or incapabilities is, is great because mm -hmm. then they can actually scout for you. It's like, okay, let's get up here. Let's look this way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, so that's that, and that kind of pulls back into that last question about help. Um, it's not that you have any trouble getting onto a bird. It's that you are actively not going to worry about half the exactly. birds. Exactly. Just, it's just not worth the hassle. But if someone can help you get in position where you are forward to the, like directly right. in front of the bird, that's helpful for you. Right. Right. Yeah. And they get well, out of your way. <laughs> and, and this, and the scouting thing. So if, if, if you're in, uh, if you have a mobility device and each one of them is going to have a different capability, but um, like when I'm out um, and I'm not familiar with the trail, I've never done it before. I'll have my friend go and they say, okay, stop here. And they know what my chair is capable of. And they'll move forward and say, oh, no, we're not going there. Because you're going to have to back up. And so, you know, there's a, there's a teamwork that is, it's very enjoyable um, sure. you know, to, to have somebody that understands and is really willing to accommodate, help you bird in the way that you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool to know. It's um, a great tip for would-be allies. And another thing too <laughs> that I'm sort of hearing maybe between the lines, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I came, I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with the idea, but the phrase of 
people who are sort of like aggressively inclusive, like they won't hear that you you don't want to keep going. Like they're like, no, you must continue to participate at all costs. And and someone's like, no, seriously, like I don't actually want to keep doing this thing. Like I want to sit right. on this bench quietly by myself for half an hour. Like, right. relax, I'm fine. Leave me alone. And Absolutely. they're like aggressively trying to include you. Um, they're trying to be nice, but they're kind of overdoing it. And I wonder if if you were like if some if you were on an organized outing and the leader was like really trying so hard to make sure that you saw the bird that's over here, and they're just not hearing you say, oh, it's not "Just happen. too much hassle. Just like forget yeah. it. I'm I'm yeah. just going to focus ahead." Yeah. Um, and and you know it's it's everybody everybody has a different capability of interacting with people. So yeah. if you're if you're if you're not comfortable just saying, you know, leave me alone, it, it becomes, it, it can be, it can be, you know, intimidating mm -hmm. um, to do that. And, you know, and the, the other thing that I would recommend, so the, one of the first devices that I got was a big wheeled walker. And I thought, okay, this, this will go anywhere. And I really didn't go and test it out before one of the Audubon field trips. And then I found myself where I became, everybody was like, oh, can Paul go over this? We'll help him over that. And then it, it, it didn't feel comfortable. It was like, mm -hmm. so I think it's important um, to really know what, how, you, how your device, uh, you know, what your device is capable of doing and the area that you're going. And that's not always something that you can do but it's really helpful because then you won't have to get into a situation where, you know, you realize you, know, you can't go over a Creek or you can't go over rocks and you've got to have somebody to help you. And then they don't understand. And it becomes, you know, it's frustrating. Sure. And I, I did see something in the chat very briefly about like um, um, what might make up a, an accessible birding location. So, um, if you're interested in learning more, folks, there's a, there's another link in the chat um, to our website, um, thebirdability.org slash access considerations. A lot of information there about the factors that can make up an accessible birding location for different people with different access challenges. Not all of them apply to everybody. Um, but yeah, have a look at that if you're interested in learning more. Paul, we're going to jump into the Q&A. Folks, if you have a question for Paul, please stick it in the Q&A box uh, so that I can see it easily and don't have to <laughs> dig it out of the chat. Um, thank you. Thank you for all this. It's it's really cool to um, to spend more time with you and, and, and learn more from you. There's there's quite a bit of appreciation in the chat. Um, so thank you. Um, let's see. Um, um, uh, yes, yeah, so 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 the question that's related to the access um, access features of a birding location, someone has asked, are there certain features or amenities of a nature preserve or trails that you seek out before you visit them? Um, absolutely. So um, one of the aspects of so this gets it gets detailed. Um, and I don't want to get too detailed, but if you look at a location and you look at the information that's provided and they actually use the word either fully accessible or ADA trail, mm -hmm. then that trail, you can rely, you can, you can make, you can uh, rest assured that the surfaces, the um, slopes, um, the widths, um, you will be able to traverse that um, in whatever device you're in. And so it's one thing to read easy trail, flat trail, trail made for family and kids. Well, the power wheelchair that I made wouldn't go on 90% of what was labeled mm -hmm. as easy trails. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unless you go out and scout, if you're only looking at published information, then look at, um, it has to say either fully accessible or um, handicapped trail or ADA trail. 
And then it was designed and built from a design standpoint. Um, rather than just classified, you know, a trail that somebody uses and they, you know, have been improving it and somebody decides that, oh, that's a accessible trail, um, which it might not be. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you might have a small um, drainage that goes across the trail and all of a sudden you come across something you can't get across and then your trip is cut short. Um, so... ADA handicapped, um, something that is actually labeled as fully accessible. Sure, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, someone's just said in the chat, is this a segue to the vertibility map? Um, yes, it's a fantastic segue <laughs> to the vertibility map. Folks, if you don't know what the vertibility map is, um, we're trying to plug this information gap because so many nature centers will say we have an accessible trail. And, and in fact, my experience, Paul, is that when you get there, sometimes they're really not accessible, even though they were labeled as such. Exactly. Um, with potholes or it's gravel, which is a really bad surface for most people, or, you know, th there's benches, sure, but they're like 20 yards over in the grass that no one can get to if they're using a walking frame safely off the concrete trail because there's no connecting surface from the trail to the bench. All of these or, things. So, or accessible uh, restrooms. And that's the biggest one. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, they yeah, might yeah. say they have restrooms, but they oftentimes they don't say whether they're accessible or not. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, how, if you're interested, in, again, in more in learning about what makes up a truly accessible birding location, that access considerations page on our website is the place to go. And if you're interested in the birdability map and contributing to it, um, which is a great opportunity to learn a bit more about what makes up an accessible birding location, um, there's a link in the chat to that as well. Um, and anyone can get to the birdability map through our website and find these, this crowdsourced information about birding locations um, in, in real detail that, that a lot of people need to know, like, what actual surface is it? Is it wide enough that my power wheelchair can travel easily down the trail? Um, are there benches so I can rest because I have chronic fatigue or, or, or whatever thing? So um, that's, yeah, the birdability map. Um, so let me, <clears throat> let me jump in and add a little bit on that birdability map. So um, I am in two different organizations. I'm on the board of the Sacramento Audubon and <clears throat> we have been using the birdability map. And one of the great aspects of this is, um, Freya, you added the link, which was huge to the individual sites. So on our webpage, I've got 15 different locations um, currently, and we're adding to that all the time, where I've gone out and completed a, build, a birdability survey. And you can either access that via the birdability map or our website. Uh, most recently, um, I'm on the um, outreach committee for the Central Valley Birding Club, and we're doing the same thing. And I'm crowdsourcing it. So I'm asking um, all the members to get familiar with the birdability map. And being that we now have that you, Freya, that you've put together the um, short printable version, mm -hmm. um, it's easy to, to just stuff in your backpack. And um, so what I'm doing with that group is I am saying, look at fill out the birdability map. I'm going to simply put a list on the website. And so rather than it being too much work, um, this is something that I think all the local chapters should be working on to really incorporate the birdability map in their own website. Um, thank you, Paul. Yes, huge plug for the birdability map. <laughs> We hope is is helping, um, yeah, plug this big big hole. We, we would like the birdability map to not be needed because um, nature centres and state parks and things like that actually have this level of detail on their own websites and at the trailhead on a really good sign so people can find out ahead of time what's coming. So they don't have to have a scout run up ahead and see if they <laughs> might be able to manage that that side trail. Speaking of scouts running up ahead of you, um, someone asked. Do you ever use walkie-talkies or another kind of communication device um, if someone's like run up ahead to see if it's a trail that you could manage? Um, no, they, no just, they just run no. back. Well, usually um, they're no more than, you know, maybe 50 yards ahead and they just kind of wait and they come back. So, sure. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Um, 
Oh, here's a question about bird blinds or bird hides, depending on where you are in the world. Um, do you have any challenges when trying to be somewhat hidden while bird watching? Mm -hmm. It seems that typical bird blinds uh, might not necessarily be very accessible. Typically, they're not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did check out a bird blind. Um, it was actually for uh, duck hunting, but you know, it 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 didn't say accessible, but it said bird blind, and it's like, no, there's no way I'm going to get down into that pit and get back up. So, um, but that's an interesting point. The 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 chair can scare birds off, um, and so I really creep along. Um, especially with the migratory uh, waterfowl, I find especially the greater white-fronted geese. They are they are very uh, they alert very quickly to my chair. So I I'll creep forward and wait and creep forward and wait, creep forward and wait. But if I'm motoring along, they'll literally take flight. So yeah, it's it's a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Although it sounds like from what you, the way you described your birding style to start with, that you tend to go to one place and then let birds come yeah. to you and you're not really yeah. chasing the birds. So I suppose that sort of works in amongst the noise and movement of, of a power wheelchair. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Um, bird blinds, by the way, we want them pinned to the birdability map. Um, we talk about accessible birding locations because not everyone uses trails or can use a trail. So trails, uh, bird blinds, uh, observation platforms, bird feeder stations um, and car birding routes. They're all different birding locations that might be more or less accessible to someone with a different um, access challenge. So yeah, if you know of a bird blind near you that's reasonably accessible, We'd love a site review just for the blind, um, not for the associated trail, because there's usually another trail nearby or something. Just for the blind, tell us about the blind. Um, yeah, like any like any built structure, um, like bathrooms or visitor centres, the accessibility of a bird blind, there's many components that make up whether it's really accessible or not, um, including things that you might not think of if you don't have a disability, like how heavy the door is and how easy it is to open it you know, with one hand, so you can wheel in on a manual wheelchair or in a power wheelchair, um, and whether the uh, observation windows um, are only at the height of a standing person, so someone who's seated can't see out um, the blind, uh, or or maybe it's just at the right height where you can't see it all, <laughs> and there's a window for little kids, and there's a window for a standing adult, and there's <laughs> nothing you can see out of. Right. So right. there's quite a few. Um, few things that make up a, an accessible bird blind. Right. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Um, so while you're looking, I'm gonna add one more thing. So um, just this week, so I, I had scheduled a uh, accessible birding outing and it was at a national wildlife refuge. And um, I decided to just check their website uh, again. And cause you never know, well, Le uh, two weeks earlier, they started work on their um, visitor center and their accessible restrooms were closed. So if you are heading out and, uh, you know, just make sure you relook at the location for any type of closures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, COVID closed a lot of bathrooms at a lot of places, mm -hmm. um, yeah. accessible bathrooms and and non-accessible bathrooms right. which makes places inaccessible for a lot of people who need exactly exactly frequent access to a bathroom right. um here's another question what advice would you give to employees of parks and preserves who want to let visitors who use wheelchairs know that they are here to help without being overbearing are there certain phrases or words that should be avoided well in for me, I'm not, okay, I'm so new to being in a chair. I'm not in a chair um, full-time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, I'm not, you know, so in terms of the language, um, you know, I, I'm, I've got a pretty thick skin. So for me, I'm okay. Um, what it would be really helpful though um, is that, those that are managing the various places, whether it's a park, whether it's a national wildlife refuge, they become familiar with the limitations of a power chair or a manual chair. And that might be that 
they actually sit in one for you know a couple hours and go try to wheel around a location because I was very surprised on on the limitations. So one of the things that would be great would be if they saw somebody in a power chair or a manual chair that they would say, oh, oh, this trail here, even though, you know, um, it's accessible right now, we've got some some leaves on it or we have um, some sand on it or we've got, you know, a rut so that they be, they become the scout that I think that would be fantastic. Sure. And in, in terms, just to just to um, add to that answer um, for whoever asked that question, um, the way that we encourage people to offer help um, to someone with any kind of access challenge um, is just to be like cool about it. Just like, hey, do you need a hand with anything or do you want me to grab that door or right. would you like help? Um, do you want me to help you pu like push up that slope? You know, it's just a regular kind of question. Like if you make it weird, then it's weird. But if you just right. ask the question um, and if the person says yes, the next thing you need to ask is, how would you like me to help you? Because mm -hmm. you might make an assumption that actually puts them in an unsafe place um, or right. you just like barge right in and, and actually you really needed to get some more guidance from the expert um, on, on what help they need. Uh, and if they say no, plenty of people don't want your help or they want to prove that they can do it themselves or actually right. they're here to try and have a workout and they want to go up that crazy <laughs> hill, you know. And so... If they say no, then don't get all funky about that. Like, don't be all like, oh, well, sorry, I was just trying to be nice. Like, that's just really <laughs> awkward. You know, like, don't be that person. Just be like, yeah, no worries. Well, let me know if you do need a hand. I'll be around. Right. Right. Just, just be cool. Um, and yeah. it's not, a lot of people will be grateful that you offered. And some people right. won't, won't be interested in your help. And that's okay. We're all allowed to have different preferences for what we want and need. Um, well, so, one. One of the things that I've been learning um, is to ask uh, mm -hmm. people for help. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been, you know, you know, I've always just prided myself over the years with this condition of being able to do things on my own. Um, but it is very helpful, um, especially with, you know, friends that want to help and want to understand, like, I've got to load my, my power chair in the back of my truck. And it's quite a rigmarole. I've got a ramp, I've got this and that. And they've got to the point now that I can literally close my eyes because I've said, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And they know my chair. And so, you know, asking for help, I think is important. It has, in, in my situation, it, it's been helpful. Sure, sure, sure. And everyone will be in different stages of their own journey right. too, especially right. with the change in function, right? Like that you just said, like this is sort of new for you. So like mm -hmm. you're still figuring things out. And some people might be so like fiercely independent that asking for help is really tricky. And so accepting your offer of help, they might do so, but begrudgingly, you know, because of their own right. Right. situation. So yeah, um, just you're allowed to people like if you say to someone hey i see you're in a wheelchair there are steps out there just so you know like they know they're in a wheelchair like that's not offensive that you said that that's not a shock right. <laughs> um right. so you you know you just 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 be right. cool um, <laughs> it's like because and be kind and be humble and be willing to learn i think if you can be kind and humble um you're already like more than halfway there. You don't need to know any more specifics. You just, you just already, you're already halfway there. If you assume you know what people need, or if you, you're doing it because you want to feel good about being so helpful, like that's not the right approach. So, so I'm um, gonna, I'm gonna segue into something. So, um, I, I think Freya, you're familiar with the Mindful Birding Group. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just had a meeting last night. So it was my, my my first uh, group meeting with them. But so there is this movement um, and, I, and I'm really excited about it um, where it's either called slow birding, mindful birding, but it is not the typical listing of birds. It's mm -hmm. sitting and observing. So with what we were just talking about, if you're out, mindful birding and you really want peace and quiet so you can listen and watch a bird maybe for 10 minutes and somebody comes up and is like here let me push you over there because you know there's a bird over there 
you know, that's a, this can be a new aspect because I really think, um, you know, with Birdability, with these other organizations, um, moving into just a, a, a just a different way of birding where, you know, you might be sitting in one spot for a long time and somebody might think that you, you know, you can't get around. Um, and so um, just for those that might not be familiar with this new movement, it's, it is where um, birders uh, might not be as active, might be less active, um, and just become a little bit more familiar with the, the fact that there's different ways to bird. Yes, thank you. Beautiful. Mindful birding, um, there's a page on our website about that. And I just stuck <laughs> that in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, mindful birding, not, it's, it's like the opposite of like ru rushing around trying to check birds right. off a list um, right. in a nutshell. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I see that De Deborah just shared that that um, that they completed an accessible uh, mid Atlantic accessible big year in 2017. That's really cool, and I always appreciated when others treated me much like other birders, asking what I might have spotted or sharing what they've seen. Guess what? People with disabilities are people too. Like exactly, <laughs> just exactly. be normal. Like just exactly. be cool, and and it's all it, yeah. Um, so, um, oh, someone suggested having a flag that says, I'm currently birding mindfully. It might be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I don't like it. Back um, away. <laughs> yeah, le yeah, back off. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe a little more polite. Um, that's, a, that's a really fun idea. Mindful birder at work. Like yeah, exactly. At work. Yeah. That should be our next t shirt. I, I also like think it. we need a t shirt that says hashtag, oh, we need a hashtag at least about birding from benches. Um, a lot of people yeah. with, you know, have a bad knee and people with chronic fatigue and different things, benches, benches are the best. And so, um, wow, now I'm getting more ideas for fundraising opportunities. Um, <laughs> while we're there, don't forget to buy a reality t-shirt if you're watching live because they'll stop being on sale tomorrow night. Um, Paul, thank you so much for coming. Um, before I finish thanking you, um, I'm also going to do another plug for... Uh, birdability because we are a nonprofit and a brand new one at that donations are really really appreciated um, to help us continue this work um, to we're trying to address the physical accessibility of birding locations we're trying to help empower a more welcoming and inclusive birding community and we're trying to share the joys of birding with people who have disabilities who don't yet realize how many joys they could get from birding and it's really cool because we kind of covered all that tonight in different ways through Paul and um, and his story. So yeah, birdability.org slash donate. Um, any donations are definitely appreciated. Paul, thank you. I think you and I could talk all day about this stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for sharing so much of your story. And um, someone did ask where the all-terrain wheelchairs in Australia came from. Magic, was... magic mobility. Magic mobility. Magic mobility. Yeah, they've okay. got a full range of chairs, but the, this one is called the X8. So it's X, the X8 Magic X8. Mobility. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, if folks want to get in touch with Paul, um, his website, fshdbirder.org, I think there's a contact there. Or you yeah. can send an email to me, info at birdability.org, and I will connect you. Um, if you use adaptive birding equipment, I would love to know about it um, because we could maybe put it up on our website, the adaptive birding equipment web page, so more people can find out because there's a yeah. lot of it, but a lot of people don't know about it. Um, so that's, please let me know if you have ideas for that stuff or you use adaptive equipment, birding equipment of any time, of any type. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for, thank you, Namal. Thank you, ABC, for really? being an integral partner for this series. It's been really awesome to um, get to learn more and share more and teach more and meet more people. And um, thank you for this awesome opportunity. Thank Thanks you for all of you. Yeah. This is wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Okay.